So this semester uh, here at the table, our theme has been about responsibility. Uh, and back in August, I started out the series with talking about how part of what it means to be made in the image of God is that we accept that we have responsibility for the plot of land that we've been given. So basically what we talked about is that we cannot be complacent as followers of Jesus, but we should take responsibility to make sure that we are growing fruit and being a part of God's mission and growing fruit in the spaces that we've been given. And then next, Larry came and talked about what it looks like to take responsibility like Jesus and how responsibility doesn't mean taking control and being in charge. It means being a servant and finding ways to serve people from below and lift people up. And then finally, last month, Jonah came and talked about workism and how a lot of times we think our main responsibility is our jobs, right? Um, a lot of us find our identity in our jobs, and our jobs are important, and you can use your gifts in your jobs, but Jonah talked about in Romans 12 how we each have unique giftings that we are called to use to build up the church, not to just build up the corporate world, right? We are called to use our gifts and take responsibility for building up the church. And so tonight, as we kind of wrap up the series, I wanna look at the life of Peter and learn from him and his responsibility that was given to him by Jesus. So we're gonna be in Matthew 16 tonight. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there. Matthew chapter 16, um, starting in verse 13. And then we also have some Bibles in the back if you need one, uh, you're welcome to take one home with you. Um, so chapter 16, starting in verse 13, it's gonna be up on the screen for you to follow along as well. So, it says, now, oh, also, by the way, I kind of mentioned this earlier. Um, we're having table discussions afterwards. So, what I'm going to, we're taking advantage of the fact that we're sitting around tables, and I don't want you to just listen to me talk the whole time. I want you to digest this text and then learn from each other, and we're going to have some questions later to prompt those conversations, but really be thinking about, hey, that was interesting to me, or that didn't make sense to me, and y'all will be able to talk about it at your tables. But what I'm gonna do in this, this time that I'm up here is just break down the text for you so that you're equipped to have those conversations. So, now we're gonna read. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some, they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not receive, reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you, have, you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but on man's. So I think this text is super interesting in light of the conversation about responsibility. And so Jesus starts by addressing his disciples here, saying, who do people say that I am? And the disciples start saying these names, and what they're saying is that you're a part of this prophet tradition, which Jesus doesn't say is necessarily wrong, like that is right, but that's not the answer he was looking for. Do we have any teachers in the room? Yeah, we got a, quite a few of you. Okay, so 
You know, if you ask your kids a question and they say the, the right, like an answer that's correct, but it's not the one you're looking for, so you just keep prompting them and say, yeah, yeah, but what else? So that's kind of what Jesus is doing here. He's like, yes, but what else? There's more. And then Simon, who we know more often as Peter, says that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And so Simon Peter right here is the first one of the disciples to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. So up until this point, in Jesus' relationship with the disciples, they had acknowledged him as the son of God, but they had not yet realized the full of extent of who he was as the Messiah, as the Christ. So this was a pretty big deal. They hadn't realized that this was who God promised Israel, his chosen people, to come and offer freedom and hope and victory. So Peter experiences and then vocalizes this revelation that he gets, right? And if you um, have been with us on Sunday mornings, we spent weeks talking about what a revelation is, but what, do, what did we say revelation means? An unveiling, yes. So Peter all of a sudden experiences this unveiling, this unveiling that Jesus is the Messiah. And so you might wonder, how does Peter achieve such a revelation? Was he more spiritual than the rest of the disciples? And I think Stanley Hauerwas says something really important in this, and he says, Simon knows what he does only because it has been revealed to him. It is important, however, that Peter's knowledge that Jesus is the Messiah not be used to develop a general theory of revelation. Simon does not learn that Jesus is the Messiah by some intuitive or mystical mode of knowing. So there wasn't this theory that he used. Rather, Simon learns that Jesus is the Messiah because he obeyed Jesus' command to be his disciple. So revelation comes with obedience. I mean, when the disciples chose to follow Jesus, when Jesus said, come and follow me, they didn't realize the extent of what they were getting into. They were obedient and leaving their life behind, but it was through this obedience that God revealed to them the magnitude of who this guy was that they were following. So revelation comes with obedience. Simon was recognizing who the Messiah is. He's recognizing that Jesus is the Messiah. And this revelation literally changes him. He can't experience this revelation and be unchanged after that. And some of you might can relate to that. When you experience the revelation and just the magnitude of who Jesus is in your life and what hope he has to offer you, you can't live unchanged afterwards. And Peter can't live unchanged so much so that Jesus renames him in this moment. And he says, you are now Peter. So that's where we get the name Peter that we know most. It's Petros in Greek, which means rock. And Jesus says, on this rock, he will build his church. So with this new name, with this revelation, comes responsibility. Not the responsibility that he's going to get to rule over the other disciples, because he's not better than them, but responsibility, which means service. A rock is supposed to be a stable structure, right? A rock is supposed to be something that you can build a stable structure on. And if a rock was to be on top, it would crush the structure, right? And so he's supposed to serve from below to bring unity. We are also called to be a part of that mission. And as as Jonah talked about, um, this responsibility of building up the church is a really, really important one. The church, I think we need to realize this, is not just a plan B because the coming again of Jesus was gonna take longer than we expected. The church was the plan from the beginning of time. The church was the plan to draw people closer to God in the already and not yet. So the church is so important and Peter's job is to bring unity within the church. Again, Howard Ross says this, it's, it's not Peter's task to make the church safe and secure or to try and ensure its existence. Rather, it's Peter's task to keep 
the church true to its mission, which is to witness to the Messiah. So that is what the mission of the church is, to witness to the Messiah. And so that is the responsibility that we get to take part in, that Peter is the first to carry that out. We get to be a part of carrying out that mission. So are we keeping the church true to its mission? So then Jesus carries on and he's like, okay, don't tell anyone about this revelation yet. Keep this to yourselves. And then he goes on to explain that he's about to go through a lot of suffering and he's about to be killed. And then he's gonna raise again. And then Peter jumps in all of a sudden and he's like, he decides that Jesus nor the disciples are ready for any of that yet. And Peter takes his new responsibility very seriously. He kind of tries to become Jesus' new PR guy. Did, do we have any PR majors in the room? I was a PR major at UMHB. Um, and we learned, I was talking to Abigail about this this week, but we would say in class all the time that no PR is bad PR. But Peter's like, no, this, this is gonna be bad PR, Jesus. Like, you dying on the cross is not gonna be good for the church. It's, it's gonna kill the momentum, Jesus. You can't do this, this is not the move. And unfortunately, what Peter is doing here is he's following the lead of Adam and Eve. The first people who brought sin into the world because they decided that they knew better than God. Let that sink in for a minute. Peter receives this news from Jesus and he steps in, not with bad intentions, he's not being malicious at all. He thinks he's protecting the church, right? He thinks he's taking responsibility for what he's supposed to do to build up the church. But he makes a mistake here because he thinks he knows better than God. God moves in ways sometimes that we don't understand, right? A lot of times that we don't understand. And what Jesus knew was a victory in this moment, Peter saw as a defeat. Sometimes victory doesn't look like what we'd imagined it to be. And the fact that Peter is the one that Jesus just said was gonna, who he's gonna build his church on, and then he's also the first one to betray Jesus is pretty humbling, right? Like we as humans, God gives us so much responsibility and he, he wants us to be a part of his plan. He wants me and you to be a part of building up his church, but then we also can be so quick to betray Jesus and try and take things into our own hands. And so literally, five verses later, after Jesus says that he's gonna build his church on Peter, then he refers to Peter as Satan. Like, that's pretty intense. Right? He says, instead of being the rock that, you're, that I'm building my church on, now, that, now you've become a stumbling block to my mission instead. Um, in light of this passage, one of my professors said this, to do church on your own terms is satanic. And I know that sounds pretty harsh, but like, that's what Jesus is saying here, to try and take things into your own hands is not the way of God. And what is not good, what is opposite of good, is evil, right? And so I think we need to take this seriously here. Are we being a part of the witness that Jesus has called us to be, or are we trying to take things into our own hands? We're all human, right? We can admit to that. We can all acknowledge that we have responsibility right? But we have to confess that we, the church, a bunch of human beings, are very human, and therefore we have to confess our limits. And that means we don't know everything. But the fact that we don't know everything is good news because that allows us to get out of the way and let God be God. And so we can learn from Peter to be quick to confess. I think there's a lot of hope in this story too. We're not gonna read, continue to read, but God doesn't give up. Jesus doesn't give up on Peter in this moment. 
He is still a huge part of building the early church. But he takes seriously when we try and take things into our own hands. So, we're gonna talk about it now. Um, and I think this, this is just super important that we realize and accept our responsibility to be a part of building up the church, but also acknowledge um, that we can really screw things up. And so I'm gonna walk through the questions real quick just to kind of hopefully explain if they're not self-explanatory, um, give you some insight into my brain and how I came up with these. But the first is, who do you say Jesus is? And um, that's where Jesus starts here. And I think we can just go around and start by acknowledging who do you say Jesus is? And it's okay if you're confused about that right now. Um, we wanna have honest conversations in this, this space. And then, how do we respond when victory doesn't look like we imagined? I think this is a hard one. Um, and again, many of us can relate to this. Um, there are times in our lives where maybe you can look back now and say, yeah, that was a victory and I can see that God was moving and he got me to a place that he wanted me to be, but it didn't look like a victory in that moment. Uh, for me, an example is I, when I was playing volleyball at UMHB, I tore my ACL and um, that didn't seem like a victory at all. It was painful and it took away something that I loved, but through that I realized how much I found my identity in sports and the Lord was able to teach me um, that that was where I was finding my identity and reshape my heart to find my identity in Him and then release that because I didn't find my identity in it, in it, in it anymore. And then that's how I ended up here at the Vista. I was able to have time to take a job here and then the Lord just um, softened my heart to be called to ministry. And so that's a simple example. It's not simple, it's a good example of um, how a victory, that didn't look like a victory, but it is. Um, so maybe share an example if you have that or if you've seen that in someone else's life. And then how did you respond? And how can you look back and acknowledge that that was a victory now? And then how do we, and if you don't get to all these questions, it's okay, this is kind of a lot, but you can pick and choose too. How do we, the church, the capital C church, the church all over the world, but specifically the Vista, um, because that's the church that we're in, right? Stay true to the mission of being a witness to the Messiah. So, with the next question, they kind of go hand in hand. You can talk about them together. But then how do we, the church and the Vista, fight against becoming stumbling blocks for the mission of Jesus? Um, and I think many of us probably have stories of how the church has been a stumbling block for, for Jesus. Um, I was even talking to a guy at the gym this week, trying to invite him to come here tonight. And he was very hesitant um, and didn't really want to come because he had some major church hurt. He had been at a church where people didn't live up to um, reflect the life of Jesus. And so that is, we see it all over the place where people claim to be Christians and a part of the church and then they're a stumbling block instead. So how do we fight against that? Um, and then, do you need to confess any ways that you've been doing church on your own terms and trying to take control? So, ready? Break. Hello? All right. Um, hopefully you guys have had good discussion so far. Um, we're going to go into a time of personal response, um, and we want to give you space to be able to do that in a couple of ways. Uh, at each of the tables, hopefully, there is a basket with a piece of bread in it and then the glass of grape juice. Um, if you follow Jesus, we invite you to take communion at your table um, amongst each other. Um, and we, uh, just in remembrance of the body that was broken for you and the blood that was shed for you on the cross um, through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Um, if you want to sit and process Sydney's message and what was shared um, at your table, we encourage you to bring your questions and prayers to Jesus, um, or grab somebody at your table that you're comfortable with and pray with them. Ask them to pray for you, um, to pray over you in this season. Or maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus, and this is your first time, and you're going, it was the table, not tables, and you're just, you know, you're confused or whatever. 
Um, just bring your, bring your thoughts and uh, whatever you're processing, bring it to Jesus. Just sit there quietly. However you want to respond, um, let's do that now. Hello, hello. I'm going to close this out in prayer. Hey God, you are so good and we're so grateful for tonight. We're grateful for the message that Sydney had. Um, I pray that we don't take that lightly, Lord, that we're continually, every day, reminded of the responsibility that you've given us to love people well, well and to share your word. God, I want to thank you for every single person that's in this room, for perfectly placing them here tonight, for their hearts and their willingness to share and be vulnerable with one another. I pray for the relationships that were formed today. I pray that you continue to um, water those and help those grow, that you continue to bless those relationships, Lord. I pray that as we go into this new season with Christmas coming up, that we don't become numb to who you are and to um, what Jesus did on the cross for us, Lord. Um, that he was born and lived a perfect life and that we're able to relate to him in such a special way, God. I thank you for the love that you have for us, for allowing us to have a personal relationship with you, to be known by you, to be chosen by you every single day. God, you are so good and we love you so much. In your son's precious name we pray.